introduction as to who they are and what they do, as well as a little presentation. Uh, on our panel today, I'm delighted to welcome Ed Barsley of the Environmental Design Studio, Alice Hamlin of Mole Architects, Wilf Mainel of Studio Bark, and Duncan Baker Brown of Baker Brown, who will start today's presentation. Um, if I can remind you all just to keep your microphones and cameras off to ease the presentation and avoid disruption, um, I'm welcome to hand over to Duncan, who will start the presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, I've got about five minutes, so um, I'm just going to be quite quick because I've got quite a few slides, but I just want to uh, get through those as soon as possible. Yeah, I'm a senior lecturer at University of Brighton School of Architecture and Design, as well as a practitioner. And I've focused on um, sustainable design, sustainable architecture for nearly 30 years now. Um, and uh, I want to talk to you about designing in the age of emergencies. Can I just confirm everyone can see my slides? Someone say yes or no? Yes. Yeah, good. OK, we live in interesting times, state the obvious, but it's been interesting for a number of years. I think because of this young lady, um, it was amazing in uh, Easter nearly two years ago, uh, Easter um, 2019, that uh, the UK Parliament came back from their recess and before they carried on speaking about Brexit, they decided to declare a climate and ecological emergency and enshrine in law um, this idea of a, a, to, that we need to be net carbon zero by 2050. And since then, everybody's declared. declared. Um, Lots of people declared. We've got new organisations, the Architects Climate Action Network, architects declare, contra contractors declare, architectural educators declare, all considering these issues and now providing resources for us. So 2019 was the year that 90% of UK local authorities committed to being net zero uh, carbon by 2030. That's 60 million citizens. Currently over 814 billion people around the world uh, have declared a climate and ecological emergency. So what do we do next? Well, for a lot of people, we're doing this. Can we really afford to save the planet? And we're getting mixed messages. So we're going to build, build, build. But for a lot of people, that means that. How can we develop and not trash the joint? And why should we care? Well, I care for these reasons. And these reasons, this is a bit of protected rainforest, but it's actually part of our supply chain. Minerals from this rainforest end up on our building sites. Um, and this is a rather scary slide that I borrowed from Vivian Westwood, the fashion designer. But it's basically, if we carry on as we are now, by the end of this century, the red stuff is uninhabitable. And you can believe that as being a bit optimistic, because look at Australia, there's still a bit of a habitable Australia. And after the bushfires in the last couple of years, would you believe that? And we've got to remember that there is no vaccine for the climate and ecological emergency. It's not going away. So from my point of view, humankind needs to learn how to manage planet Earth's resources. And it's all about that. And it's often designers and constructors who do this. So why us? Well, the construction sector consumes 50% of all raw materials mined and harvested annually around the world. And it's responsible about, for about 45% of all carbon emissions. In the UK, we consume 600 million tonnes of products a year. We generate 200 million tonnes of waste a year and 120 million tonnes is from the construction sector. So from my point of view, if you sort out the construction sector, you're halfway towards uh, meeting our net zero carbon targets. But there are big challenges, not least that we exist as a linear economy where we take materials, we make them into things, use them for a bit and throw them away. We are the only organism on planet Earth that turns up at a place, consumes away, makes a desert out of it and moves on to the next place to destroy it. The opportunities, well, we need to turn those linear systems into circular ones to create a biosphere and a technosphere. Uh, and we need to create a circular economy. And just to sum up what a circular economy is, it's a place where there's no waste. Waste from one ecology is a resource for another. In a circular economy, old BMWs are source material for new BMWs. At the moment, old BMWs are source material for road fill. If you want to know more about it, read Cradle to Cradle, which is all about doing good, not less bad. And concepts that we might get our heads around as architects in a, uh, trying to practice in a circular way is considering our buildings as material stores for the future, stuff we used to do. 
Uh, there are new ways of procuring, for example. So here in Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, all the light fittings there are leased from Philips. But the bottom line there is that Philips end up with all that material at the end of its life, and therefore they design the material, the fittings in this case, to have an end of life strategy, and they reuse that material as a, a resource. So some good news. Since 2010, the construction industry is nearly half the amount of waste it sends to landfill inc and incineration. And RAP estimates that 20% of the construction industry is already circular. And things are changing. Some people have a plan. Here's a couple of uh, circular economy route maps, one for London, one for Brighton that's just about to be um, published. The one from Brighton is for the construction sector. And we also have the RIBA 2030 Climate Challenge and the amazing Letty Climate Emergency Design Guide. These documents are coming up with a consensus for a carbon descent plan. Uh, so they're considering embodied carbon, operational carbon, whole life carbon. We have a consensus of how to descend towards the 2050 targets. We actually know what to do. And I've written a book about it as well that you might want to have a look at. We're about to rewrite this one, the reuse atlas. So you might want to consider refusing, this is radical, refusing a commission uh, if it supports a high carbon um, lifestyle. But would you dare do that? But before, if you can't refuse, then ensure that if you've got a commission, reduce the consumption of resources that go into the designing, the constructing, the inhabiting, the maintaining and the deconstruction of your building. And if you can't reduce, then try and use secondhand materials. And that's where retrofit comes in as well. Secondhand buildings, obviously. And you do that before you recycle because recycling has sorry, my phone just kicked off. Recycling has an embodied carbon and waste aspect to it. And you do all of that before you specify new materials. And we really need to stop treating sustainability as a Mickey Mouse issue. This is really nicely explained here by Bernard from the World uh, Bank. And don't forget that architecture can really matter. And our biggest challenge is not changing today. Thank you. Keep well and keep safe. Trying to unsave there, am I off? You're muted, Brian, I think. Thank you, Julia. Duncan, thank you very much for that, that presentation. Much appreciated. Uh, Ed, if you'd like to continue, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was fantastic, Duncan. I think, I suppose, following on from that, um, looking at sustainability, I'm going to focus slightly more on um, water management and flood risk in particular. Um, so I, my name is Ed Barsley. I run a practice called the Environmental Design Studio. And I think looking at flood risk and understanding it in relation to sustainability, at the moment in the UK, one in six properties are at risk of flooding. Within, within 30 years, it's going to be one in three. And when properties do flood, there's so much waste and damage that can be done to the property, the waste created from the damage done to the property and energy used in actually drying out and reinstating those buildings that we need to see that as a massive issue that of, of sort of um, to cutting that sort of point in the loop in which and, and finding a way to adapt our existing and a new build uh, stock to be flood resilient. So I'm just going to share a couple of slides. Let me know if this isn't sharing. Hopefully it is. Um, OK, great. So, yeah, I run the Environmental Design Studio and uh, we're a social venture set up on uh, reducing the exposure and vulnerability of communities and environments to natural and human induced hazards. Um, don't just work on flooding. We also look at a variety of different themes uh, such as resilience to heat waves, water scarcity, and a variety of other issues. Um, last year, um, a, a book I wrote for the RBA was released um, called Retrofitting for Flood Resilience, a Guide to Building and Community Design. And, and it looks at flood risk at a variety of different scales and um, it's got lots of different uh, and in relation to both new build and existing contexts as well. And so I think that's something that we need to consider is that we have a huge responsibility in how we build new buildings, but there's a, it's a massive issue in how we retrofit and adapt our existing building stock. And that the scales and strategies are discussed you know, right down to from the sort of catchment, the community right down to the individual building scale on what we can do. And, and there's, some, there's so many different things we can do that there's lots of opportunity for design to intervene in this area and make really positive changes. Um, as I said, the book was launched in January last year, before lockdown, we were very fortunate really to you know, avoid many of the issues that have come in the last year. Um, um, in terms of the 10 takeaway tips for today, I'm just going to run through some of these and I won't read them through now, I'll go through them step by step. And the first really is to understand and follow the code of practice for property flood resilience. Now, this 
this was released in February last year, initially by the government, um, and it's uh, the detailed guidance is, was released in February this year. And what it does is it basically sets out a framework in which we, we should be working um, in flood resilient design. And this applies to both new build and existing properties, uh, commercial and residential, uh, multiple as well as individual properties. And you're, what you'll probably spot here is that it kind of tracks slightly in parallel to the ROBA um, uh, sort of plan of work and their process. And what it hopefully enables is for, for there to be consistency in the industry and in how we actually look at designing and developing properties to be flood resilient. But because before there was lots of gaps in the methods, like some people would get really detailed information on certain bits, some people would survey the property in a different way. And and that once the building was built, how would you actually know that it's been sort of checked, certified and handed over appropriately? So what there is now is a very sort of two, three hundred page guidance document that literally shows you through, throws you all the different steps and stages to consider. Um, I'm also going to be running one of the RBA's core CPD programs this year um, called the Flood Fundamentals of Flood Resilient Design. And, and I'll be going through those different stages and steps of the code of practice in a lot more detail because essentially, whatever sort of scale or type of building we're designing, we, if you can follow this process, then there'll be a, a sort of a good uh, paper trail and understanding that it's been designed and um, constructed and commissioned appropriately. The next thing I'd say is just to consider the scales of influence. And as designers, we, we do work at a variety of different scales. And so we have an opportunity to intervene and think about how we can sustainably manage water. And, and it might not be that we have an opportunity to affect large scale change with, if your projects are at the smaller scale, but it can have a huge impact on people's lives, even just at that building scale to make a property flood resilient. And in terms of data, I would say do where possible request the Environment Agency's product for data on different projects. It, it can be really useful to build up a detailed understanding of, of a flood risk context. You've got things like historic flood outlines and different future flood, uh, future climate data as well. And so we can be informed by the different thresholds and information that we get about a site. Uh, we can allow that to help inform and inspire our design process. The next thing I'd say is just to understand the difference between flood risk vulnerability and exposure. See this funny picture here of me on the left, cut in half, there's no such thing as bad clothing, just bad weather, or bad weather, just bad clothing. Right? And, and just because a property is exposed to flood, flood risk, it doesn't have to be vulnerable. You know, there are things that we can do to actually adapt the, the building's fabric, to add resistance measures and to change the consequences that floods can, can cause. And so, um, again, there are lots of different tactics that we can use to reduce the exposure of a building to flooding, but we need to think about how we can intervene in, in different ways. The next, I'd say, is to recognise the intangible and indirect impacts of flooding as well. And, We've recently launched a series called Our Flood Resilient Home that has been, I suppose, showing success stories of ways in which people have adapted. And it's been very powerful to hear different people's stories of the journey they've been through. And, and at the moment, we seem to be doing a lot of counting of the costs of repairing you know, the bricks and mortar and the damage to the buildings themselves. But we're not, I don't believe, um, sort of really understanding the impact on people's lives and, and their mental and physical health that it can have, that floods can have. So um, I think when we're sort of trying to rank this and think about the value of flood resilient design, we do need to consider the wider impacts of it. Um, when it comes to historic properties, I would reference and recommend checking out the Historic England Guide to Flooding, their um, report they've got, because you know, it recommends things like the speed of drying certain plasters. You know, you, could, you don't want to dry it too quick, you don't want to dry it too much. And so there are some really useful tips and, and, and tricks I'd recommend in there. The next I'd say is to think, you know, ensure that different strategies work for specific flood risk contexts, because there are a variety of different types of flood risk and you might for example use a flood barrier or a flood door but the property has a suspended timber floor and it's a groundwater flood risk and it just comes up through the floorboards and completely undermines the strategy so if we don't know actually the kind of fundamental uh, flood risk context then it, it can be undermined next i'd say you know use scenario testing and visioning to communicate the consequences and you know, many of us will do this uh, anyway but i'd say that it's a with thinking about these alternate climate futures, we need to be, you know, pulling our skills together and finding different ways to communicate um, you know, positive scenarios, positive adaptation strategies, and and get those ideas out there and um, sort of start asking these questions. Um, nine, I'd say, you know, plan for future climate conditions, and and by that I really mean uh, thinking about how we live with residual risk and how we design the wider built environment to be to be resilient to these conditions. If you look at somewhere like Florida; they now have what's called sunny day flooding, where at high tide, the water just washes through the town at sort of ankle and knee height, you know, different 
it's perfectly blue sky. It's just that with sea level rise, you're now getting places which are regularly inundated. And we need to think differently about how we can design large scale um, for, that, for that change. And lastly, I'd just say find ways to reward resilience. And there's been huge changes in the insurance sector in the last uh, couple of months, actually. And sort of almost saying if, if people put these measures in place, it can reduce their premiums, even some grants going towards that. And I think if we can start to incentivize change, that we're going to see huge, um, a sort of huge shift in behavior in that regard, because at the moment it's too easy to not to not adapt. And if we can sort of find these mechanisms and changes, um, it, it can sort of have a, a huge impact. Um, I'll just finish up there, but I, I suppose the themes that I hope that we could discuss at the end of this session are maybe how we can get more proof of concept precedents built. Um, I was involved in a REBA policy report a few years ago, which supposed five pilot, um, pilot licenses each year could be proposed for innovation. So essentially you allow five buildings each year to be built that are just trialing and testing new approaches, different approaches, so that we can allow some innovation to come into you know, uh, sustainable and uh, flood resilient design. Thinking about how we might incentivize adaptation, uh, lots of huge topic about how and where we should build, uh, should we conserve or preserve, and how we can communicate the wider benefits of sustainable and resilient design. So hopefully we can chat about this at the end of the session, but thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ed, yeah, really good. Um, Alice Hamlin from Mole Architects, we'd like to continue, please. Brilliant, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I'm Alice, I'm an architect at Mole and also a certified Passive House designer. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Passive House, but also more broadly what we're doing at Mole and the role that um, myself and my peers have had in driving this um, to try and give you some ideas of what you can do if you're not the director of a practice. Um, so low energy design has always been a big part of the work that Mole do, but we now know that we need to massively increase the ambition of every single project. Um, and we need to do this with every client, not just the ones that come to us who already have an interest in this area. Um, and as I see it, there are kind of three levels where we have an influence. Um, so what we can do on um, in the office on individual projects, like how can we increase the ambition and targets that our clients are going for? Um, linking up and knowledge sharing with others in the industry through events like this, um, which is really, really helpful. Um, and then also getting involved in the wider sort of political side. So responding to consultations, uh, talking to the local authority, getting involved with campaigns by groups like Letty and ACAN. Um, and one thing that I found really works well is that if you're working on these different levels in combination, it feels a lot more powerful than focusing on just one at a time because um, they all feed into each other. You learn different things from each. Um, and you kind of need that bigger picture view as well as the sort of detailed day to day view um, to understand what needs to change um, and also to feel like you're having an impact um, and which gives you the motivation to keep going. Um, so at an office level um, at Mole, one thing we decided to do was to train up in Passive House. Um, and that was kind of because it fits with how we work anyway. We've always favoured a sort of fabric first approach and Passive House is kind of the ultimate incarnation of that. Um, but also it ties in with the targets for heating demand and operational energy that Letty and the RABA and others are telling us that we need to meet for new build and for retrofit um, in order to be able to power our buildings with only renewable energy by 2050. Um, so I'm sure you're all more or less familiar with the principles of Passive House, so I won't go into that now, but when, when designing to this standard, then you use a modeling system, which is called the Passive House Planning Package or PHPP. Um, and this is basically just a very clever spreadsheet um, and it allows you to accurately predict the operational energy demand of the finished building. Um, and then as the project progresses, then you track any changes that you make to make sure that you're still meeting the Passive House criteria. Um, and it's this process, as well as the kind of underlying design principles that make Passive House really effective. Because um, as designers, by using these tools as we're going along, um, it gives us a really deep understanding of, um, of how our building's actually going to perform based on real data. And we have a way of um, keeping track of those details so we don't end up with a performance gap. So what we're telling our clients we're going to achieve, we can be confident that we will. Um, and we've only just started using these tools ourselves, like in-house. But we've already learned a lot from this and also stuff that, like the lessons that we're learning on the projects that are going for certification can also be applied to all of our other ones. So we're sort of doing it by stealth on the ones where we, we're not necessarily going for the, the tick in the box. 
Um, and the model is actually quite simple. Once you get used to it, it's fairly quick to use. And uh, one aspect I really like is the ability to test overheating, uh, which is something I think is overlooked, but it has a huge impact on the comfort for the end user. So we've really valued being able to explore this properly right at the start of the design process. Um, but clearly getting um, qualified as a pass to pass designer isn't going to be right for every practice, um, but the principles aren't difficult and there's sort of something that you can learn you know, regardless of what level you're at and what experience you've got. Um, there's always more that you can learn about building physics and the, and how to apply it and how to improve um, the energy use of your buildings. Um, and there's a lot of, I know the AECB are running a lot of really good webinars at the moment um, and there's a couple of really good sort of rules of thumb guides that are out there and that give you a really good starting point. Um, so yeah, so that's all great, but it's only kind of covering the energy use side of the problem. Um, and as we know, sustainability is a really broad topic um, and it's no good looking at individual things in isolation. Um, and there's also, it's so our sort of next project at Mole is um, that we're currently working on is how best to broach, the, broach this with clients at the start of a project. Because um, there's a huge amount of information for them to absorb, especially if they've never done a building project before. Um, so one way we're thinking of doing this is maybe using the One Planet framework, which was developed by Bioregional. Um, and this is really flexible. It's essentially just a list of 10 headings that make sure that you're covering everything that you need to in a really broad way. Um, and then as the project develops, then you can start to put metrics against that and targets and, and bit, make it into a sort of measurable sustainability plan. Um, so yeah, I just want to end by saying a lot of this work is coming from me and the other architects and assistants at MOL. Um, you know, we've all been researching, testing out different tools and proposing ideas for improving our processes. Um, and this has worked really well because obviously the directors can't do everything and the knowledge sort of needs to be spread throughout the office. Um, and often it's the job architect who can have the most influence on a specific project. Um, so if there's people listening in today who feel like they might not have enough sort of experience or influence to um, to sort of get into this area, I would just say you know, keep reading the guidance, keep talking to people, keep researching, um, and you'll be very surprised where it takes you. Fantastic. Thanks, Alice. That's really inspiring, particularly for thinking how we can engage with junior members of our practices. Very useful. Um, Will, I'm going to hand over to you for the last portion of the presentation before the, the discussion and Q&A session, please. Right. Uh, are you getting me? Can you hear me? Yeah, got you, Will. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so yeah, I'm Will from Studio Bark. Um, we are also environmentalists um, and we do some architecture. This is a, um, our, one of our first buildings, Code for Sustainable Homes Level 6 in Norfolk. Um, a little project in Suffolk, we won a um, RIBA East Award. Um, another small uh, project in uh, Bista and even smaller in London and a very low impact cork dwelling in uh, in North London, but I'm, I'm more here today to, to kind of um, present a kind of provocative, um, I guess, thought about how we can look to assess the way we design for the future. So it's kind of going a bit back to basics and it's um, some of my really terrible sketching. So uh, apologies for that. I'm sure there's many better around me today. So anyway, I'm going to talk about energy and time. So 99% of all Earth's energy originates from the sun. And the number that quantifies this in watts is very, very big. Theoretically, 90 minutes of the energy that hits the Earth's surface could power global human energy needs for a whole year. Let's look at a simple graph. So um, we have energy going up and time going across. So 300 million years ago, we had a nice little fossil called coal. Others called crude oil and fossil gas arrived more recently, but fast forward about eight minutes ago and the sun gave us solar PV and more recently than that, the wind. The problem with fossil fuels, aside from them being ancient and irreplaceable, is that they must be burnt to produce energy, resulting in CO2. So what does this mean? So pre-industrial revolution, we had loads of lovely trees on the earth and most of the carbon was locked up in the ground. We had balance. 
Now, in 2020, we have very few trees left, which have been replaced by buildings, industry, infrastructure, and so carbon has moved from the earth to the atmosphere in balance. So now time for a joke. How much carbon does it take to change a light bulb? First, there's a light bulb. But wait, actually, I might need to have some breakfast if I'm to have the energy to change this light bulb. And that bowl of cereal has a cost. That cost is roughly 1.2 kilograms of embodied CO2. But wait a minute, I can't reach. I'm going to need a chair. This also has an embodied CO2 cost. Noting I will probably use the chair again, not so much the cereal. So then, what's the difference between embodied carbon and in-use carbon? Let's look at another graph. Carbon dioxide going up and time going across. Our LED pole has an embodied cost of 2.4 kilograms of CO2 to the point it is first switched on, then continues to have an in-use CO2 cost during its lifespan. The halogen bulb has a much lower embodied cost, but is much less efficient in use, and therefore both break even in less than six months. To recap, the embodied energy is everything before the first use, and the in-use is everything during use. So how does this translate into our buildings? So let's take an ordinary masonry building and compare it to an ordinary timber building. The masonry building might have a life expectancy of say 150 years, whereas a timber building might be 60. The masonry building releases 200 tonnes of CO2 during construction. Yes, the weight of about 20 double-decker buses. And if anyone's weighed CO2 before, it's not particularly heavy. The timber building releases 80 tonnes of CO2. So plotting these on a similar graph, you can see that the masonry building has released 200 tonnes of CO2 once built, and then continues to release CO2 whilst in use. The timber building, however, has released 80 tonnes of CO2 once built, but after roughly 60 years, the timber building needs to be rebuilt at a further cost of 80 tonnes. After approximately 100 years, the timber buildings have released more CO2 into the atmosphere. So masonry wins, right? Or is this just too simple? Let's look at this again. Same graph, masonry building costing 200 tonnes of CO2. However, after 10 years, Mr and Mrs Jones get married and decide they want a new kitchen, more CO2. And then in another 10 years, they have a child and decide to redecorate, more CO2. And then the kid grows up and they need an extension, more CO2. But because this building is made of bricks and mortar and is hard to adapt to a changing climate and changing human needs, it is demolished before reaching the end of its useful service life. Let's look at the timber frame with the same renovations, but the difference is that this timber frame has been designed with circular principles and is ready to be adapted. Nothing goes to landfill and nothing has to be rebuilt. So what does our prime minister have to say about this? He says, build, build, build. We don't agree. We can't put the buildings of the past in landfill today, and we can't put the buildings of today in landfill tomorrow. We need to move towards adaptive reuse for existing buildings and radical adaptability for all new buildings. Looking back at the 1960s, the home computer was something you could walk into, whereas in, 90, in 2020, it's something you can walk around with. And what about our houses? So in the 1900s, they looked a bit like this, probably burning coal. In 1960s, many switched to gas. And in 2020, you may be able to charge your plug-in hybrid. But one thing you may know hasn't changed much is the houses themselves. So in 2080, where do I park my flying car? What we build now must be ready for the future, no matter what that future is. What we need to do is stop burning ancient fossil fuels, drive down embodied carbon emissions, move towards a circular economy and design for radical adaptability. We need to shift technology away from resource extraction, but towards resource circularity. We need technologies to help us understand the complex recipe of resources that make up our buildings, smart energy systems to reduce, to reduce our consumption, and we all need to design for disassembly. So what could this future world look like? A world where for every tree chopped down to build with, five are planted in its place. Communities build together and learn together. Communities plant and harvest food together. And when the needs of the community changes, they adapt their buildings together, making sure nothing goes to landfill. We believe that humanity can live with nature rather than against it. That's brilliant. Thank you, Wolf. Really good. Um, so that, thank you all for the presentations today, um, all for covering different aspects of the of the topic, uh, and I think certainly giving some inspiration on 
different ways we can we can take up the, the mantle and, and implement things in our working environment and also uh, in our day to day lives. Um, you would have noticed a uh, second of the poll forms appearing. We've had one already. Um, thank you for filling those out. Um, and I'll perhaps start by going through some of the questions Juliet has put in the chat window um, to get us all engaged. Uh, and if you have any other questions, uh, please add them to the chat or feel free to raise your hand as, as we progress. Uh, so I'll just go to the top. Um, first question was question for Ed Barsley, please. How do you balance the embodied energy impacts of the role of concrete in flood resilient architecture and infrastructure? And at the same time, how do you ensure appropriate accessibility when building in flood risk zones? Yeah, thanks very much. I think I think that might be well well for the question potentially. Um, yeah, so I think that what's interesting to consider with is actually where you might position concrete if you did need to use it in a building, because um, what some of the projects we've been looking at, you might actually only need to make the lower you know, even meter of the property. You might only need concrete in that element in that area, and it could even be a prefabricated modular timber frame element above. Just thinking about actually where might that water come. Um, you can obviously make buildings dry proof or wet proof, you know, resistant or recoverable. And so that's one of the things that we're starting to look at a lot more and learning from the Australians actually at how they're making their buildings uh, recoverable and wet proof. They have floods that are three, six meters deep over there and they can't keep the water out, they can't resist. And so when you're not needing to, you know, sort of reinforce the, pro the building in that same way and make it more recoverable, you can actually change some of the materiality. And, and so, um, the sort of the way in which those buildings can be easily dried or even have certain elements which might be redundant are, are quite interesting because if you need to get into that cavity or that area to dry it quicker that's part of the design process that we might need to consider and so tying it back to concrete you know we need to be really careful about where we are using it on our buildings but it can also be a necessity for certain elements within the design process but it's sort of silly to generalize with that um, in terms of accessibility for flood risk zones, I mean, there are many different flood risk zones and it depends on the site, obviously, in the context. And it might be that you use it in, you design that accessibility in as part of the landscaping. It might even be that the, the sort of uh, setup is access is there if and when you need it in the event of a flood. But otherwise, it's actually a private balcony, a private space. There's some examples where I think it was um, Nissan Adams Studio had a concept where the cladding dropped down between the balconies and linked up like a safe causeway. That people could walk along in the event of a flood. So it doesn't have to be something that we live with permanently that's always there as something raised. It's just and another exciting opportunity for us to innovate and design differently. Brilliant. Thank you, Ed. Um, next one down on the list is a question from Duncan, and I sense this is uh, might offer this out to everyone who's taking part today uh, and perhaps take an initial answer from any of the panel if you wish to, but anyone else here, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, what do we find is the main obstacle to you and your clients becoming more climate literate? That got them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll follow up with Duncan's next question to the attendees. Um, asking if we've got a, an idea of uh, what is meant by whole life carbon. So it's touched on by um, Wilf just shortly. Um, does anyone have any further questions or anyone want to, to debate these particular questions? I think, sorry, uh, Brian, Craig Weston from Inskema. We're, we're sort of touching on the um, zero carbon project at the moment and it's um there's just so much information out there um and sort of defining that defining the the whole life carbon of a, a material let alone the whole building is is challenging um and me and a couple of the colleagues attended a talk by um Fid and clegg bradley studios they created that open source um document which is really useful that's provided real sort of useful educational tool but I suppose you know, what, for the, sort of the, the layman, for us to be able to um, talk about this topic confidently, we need to be able to discuss it concisely in a very black and white terminology 
to the to the end user and that's that's challenging when there isn't a straight <laughs> straight answer for for these uh, these areas of discussion you know what is zero carbon what is net zero carbon I sort of put it back in your court <laughs> I, I can maybe take that one, Brian, or, or at least try and take it. Okay. Because I think this is a really important point, and I think the terminology is a real challenge, actually. Um, I think we are, I mean, obviously, we've got a kind of central government trajectory of net zero carbon, but for a very long time, we've been talking about net zero carbon in the, in the building world, about being net zero operational carbon. Um, so actually, personally, my feeling is that we need to redefine. So, and I think that's why whole life, I think whole life can both get political traction and public traction because people understand that concept. Um, and I think, you know, just offsetting carbon willy nilly to various different schemes is really not the solution. Um, we actually have, we do a very good job of offsetting a lot of our carbon outside of the UK. Most of our products, um, a majority of our, you know, products, whether, whether it's technical products, computers, whatever, are made in the, in the Far East. So that's not going to solve a global problem because the climate is all around us. It's not just sitting around our island. So I do think I'd be really interested what the other panelists think about what is a term that they can really get behind. Um, because I feel like what we're all aiming for is that we truly understand the impact of our buildings over their life cycle. Thank you. Uh, was that your hand up for that response there, Will? Um, so the next next question down the the list, uh, open to all attendees, uh, was picked up earlier. Was the uh, would we accept a commission uh, for building that encouraged a high carbon lifestyle? For example, a coal mine, airport extension, or HS two. How do we do with that, that, the moral dilemma? Of, yeah. I mean, I asked that question because um, you know it's it stung architects to Clare recently um, and it, in a way it's the whole reason raison d'etre behind architects declare um, was to ask these difficult questions and uh, I, I did yeah I mean we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic um, times are hard and uh, if any of us got a, a regional airport extension to do <laughs> or even a, uh, an international one uh, would we really say no uh, you know, how, how do you process that if you really believe there's a climate and ecological emergency at the moment? How responsible do you feel as the designer of something that facilitates that lifestyle? Um, personally, I feel responsible, so maybe that's why I'm not rich. But, um, you know, we, I, I, I mean, I'd offer it across the panel. Has anyone got a brighter idea than refu refusing? Alice. <laughs> that's just because I silly left my mute on. Um, <laughs> well, I think it's um, it it's a good question because um, I suppose a lot of companies that have set themselves up who with an interest in this area um, are not going to be the ones that people come to to ask them to design an airport. Um, but the so then in a way that's kind of yeah it's it's avoiding the problem as as you say because the the um, it's the system that we're within that is the overall problem. It's the system where people do want to fly a lot and that's a lifestyle and and, um, and is something that people expect to be able to do. Um, so refusing one project is not gonna make that change. So I suppose it's using every opportunity to, um, to broadcast the problems um, so that people are making more informed decisions um, outside the framework of a particular project if that makes any sense at all <laughs> yeah thank you has anyone got any else anything else on that question i was wondering how will how will airport or ed's airport commission was going <laughs> um, <laughs> we've never had an airport commission request but i would really enjoy having that conversation with um but but i know i think it's a it's a really interesting point and i think for for any kind of um student um attendees or any kind of young people going into a new type of architecture one thing that we found really reassuring is that for um i don't know the five the first five years of our existence as a practice we were really struggling to communicate this to clients and clients didn't really want it and we were trying to force environmental principles on our clients 
Where, whereas now we have clients that specifically want this, and we we are in a I'm, I'm in a luxurious position sometimes when people say I want a six car underground garage to say look we're just not really interested in that project I'm afraid, um, and so I think it's a really I think it doesn't always have to be doom and gloom it's a really exciting opportunity to kind of you know morph your business into something that people maybe really want in the future. Yeah, I think I'd I'd follow I agree with Wolf really that actually it's. It's now a kind of key selling point or something that people are expecting. And I know many young practitioners coming through who are sort of innovating and working in this area as well, and clients are starting to expect it. But also, I think it's the accountability is an interesting thing. And uh, it is uh, hopefully becoming more difficult to, to greenwash something and to just sort of make it look like it is environment because it can be found out. And um, particularly on sites when I'm tying it back to flood risk, you know. They can't just sort of push it in the corner now. It's becoming more difficult to. I know it's still happening with development, but um, the more we can get kind of exemplar approaches out there, the, the more difficult it would be for people to just push through that business as usual approach. Thank you, Ed. Thank you all. Um, on to the next question. Uh, the significant reductions in energy generation make the dreaded ROI for retrofit insulation less attractive. Will we get to the point where it is massively cheaper to add AC air conditioning than upgrade fabric using lots of effort and resources when renewables are less impactful. So I guess that um, question is sort of touching on the idea that, well, if the grid decarbonizes, then we don't need to worry um, that as to how much energy our buildings are using. Um, but I suppose the counter argument to that is that um, there's a limit to how much renewable energy we're going to be able to generate as a, as a country. Um, and that's what a lot of the targets that the ROBA and Letty um, and Green Building Council have been working from. They've taken, OK, this is how much renewable energy we're going to have in 2050. Um, that we're going to be generating. Um, this is how many houses we're going to have. This is what percentage of energy housing needs to use. And then you, you from that, you have a, a rough figure per household um, that each house is sort of allowed to use to, in order to be net zero. So, um, which is, I think that that's kind of the argument for um, why we need to upgrade the fabric of our existing buildings at the moment is because without that, we're just not going to have enough energy to go around without also burning fossil fuels. Thanks, Alice. Uh, next question on the list, how can we incentivize adaptation? <laughs> Go on, Duncan. Uh, uh, do something about VAT for a start. So it's tax. Um, I think also educate some of the, the ministers out there that still think things just need to be bulldozed and rebuilt. Um, Mr. Jenrick, for example. So I, yeah, we've got to adapt to what we've uh, we've already got. And I've just said that in the chat. But uh, to do that at the moment, you're going to get um, penalised. It's easy, it's cheaper to do new build projects that are zero rated. Um, and there's vir virtually no uh, option for reduced VAT at the moment. It's all too complicated, so it ends up being 20%. Um, and uh, we've got to um, we've got to turn that around and understand that there's a huge amount of, it, uh, of of work to be done and jobs to be had adapting what's already built, been built. Um, and that it should be incentivized because that's an, an that's a bit of low lying fruit in terms of meeting uh, anyone's net zero carbon targets. And by the way, just to be clear, I, t I, I use the terminology net zero, but I, I'm not a fan of that because it, the, the phrase implies offsetting somewhere. So it should be zero carbon. And actually, it should, we shouldn't just be preoccupied with carbon. It's all resources. And that's why I just talk about reducing the consumption of stuff, because we get preoccupied with carbon for good reason. But, there's, you know, there's the water footprint and all the resources, the footprint of that. And it, that's it called the ecological footprint, actually. And that's what we should be preoccupied with, really. I think just just on that, I mean, I think what, what um, a lot of life cycle assessments are going down is CO2 equivalents. So it's looking to help for us to look at all those environmental indicators, some of which Duncan mentioned, and kind of package them up in a in a in a, in a unit, CO2E, 
Um, and I think, well, obviously there's, there's many, many flaws in that, but it's such a complex problem we're trying to solve that I do think it is good if we can kind of collectively get behind CO2 equivalents. That's my view anyway. Thank you. Uh, next question on this, should we conserve or preserve? Yeah, I'll just jump in on that. I, wanted, I suppose I was posing that question because what we found in a number of uh, conservation areas and communities that are often very typically low lying is that a lot of the policy that we have in place and restrictions around what we do to listed and uh, conservation areas is inhibiting adaptation. And so you're seeing buildings that there was um, a gentleman who wanted to adapt the cladding on his property to make it flood resilient and wasn't allowed to and it was every, every single year it was being flooded and damaged and essentially at, at some point it was costing huge amounts of money to repair to reinstate and we need to think about how we're going to gracefully adapt to the changing climate in some of these areas and with some of our properties that we have so I think there's a really interesting tension and question there in, in um, bubbling up. Thank you. Uh, next one is how can we get more I think Brian's frozen. Uh, yep. You froze, Brian. Uh, oh, did you hear? Uh, how can we get more proof of concept precedents built? Planning. I mean, planning is our biggest hurdle by a very long shot, I'm afraid, and, and educating local local uh, planning authorities. I think um, you know the GLA is moving very very quickly, and it's quite encouraging. But that's very London centric. Um, but I do, I do, and. I, mean, I also think Suffolk Coastal and Suffolk's not bad and some of the Norfolk councils aren't bad, but there are some really, really dark aged councils at the moment in terms of planning department and they've got no idea what they're looking at. They can look at two buildings and you can greenwash anything through those councils. So um, I think design review panels are really, really interesting, but I think we also need to try and get to the officers. I just a slight defence of the officers. Um, I think there's there are more and more local authorities. Uh, I'm, if you if you talk to Clara, who was the editor of the uh, Let, Letty Climate Crisis Design Guide, uh, she's she's putting together a, a well, has put together a list of in a way enlightened local authorities and local authorities wanting to know what to do. So I think we're at a stage. I mean, I think this this uh, discussion now is exactly where the industry is. A lot of people wanting to know what to do next, and that includes. Uh, planning departments, because that, that's why I mentioned how many citizens are in uh, local authority regions that have declared, though the politicians that have declared have put that pressure on their officers, local authority officers, to meet those overly ambitious 2030 net zero carbon targets. And they're all running around now with their recovery plans that are, their, that are folded in with not just COVID recovery, but they're understanding that that's all part of the climbing, climate crisis. So. I'm hearing it from all over the country that people are trying to understand, but doesn't, that doesn't mean the planning officer that you'll deal with tomorrow will understand. But I think given an, a, another year or so, we'll be in a different position. There's a lot going on. That, that's really encouraging. Um, I'm just conscious of time now. We've got five minutes left of the session. It looks to be about three or four questions left on the list. So I think that's probably achievable in getting through what we have left today. Uh, next question is from Stephen Riles. How long will it be before building regs moves to adopt passive house principles? There can only be so far we push the thickness of our external walls before we have to adopt a whole building strategy. That's one for Alice again. I guess so, but I don't know how to answer it. Um, well, we've obviously got the uh, future homes stuff that's coming through um which is the there were sort of some steps forward and some sideways steps with the, the what's going to be brought through and um most you know in the next kind of steps so um but i'm afraid i don't actually know the time scales off the top of my head um but in terms of, i know a lot of planning authorities are starting to look at whether they can introduce passive house as a as a requirement sort of faster than the building regs do and their hands are tied a little bit by um uh sort of legal concerns you know if, if it opens them up to a load of appeals that's not helpful um but they also have quite a strong argument from the climate act in terms of they if if they have to um 
meet net zero by 2050 and to meet net zero we need to be doing everything to passive house that gives them an argument to use thanks alice duncan yeah, uh, what I would add to that, um, Alice, is that I think what local authorities are doing is uh, drafting uh, supplementary planning guidance, because I, I don't think I, if it'd be good, I'd be interested if there's anyone in the audience that know what's going on in building control, but uh, building regulations are, are way down there. And what we're talking about is way up there. And the gulf between the two in the short term will be met by supplementary planning documents. And we've done that in Brighton already. If you want to build in Brighton, you've got to prove that you understand what a circular economy is. And that's quite a big deal. And it's out there now. So um, it's, pla it's planning documentation, I think, planning legislation. Thank you. Uh, next question, how can or should we communicate the wider benefits of sustainable and resilient design? Well, it's, it's networks, isn't it? I mean, I think organisations like ACAN at the moment are doing just so much more than we've done in decades of inactivity. Um, and, you know, we're getting parliamentary questions coming in, we're getting um we're getting kind of letters going to the to the secretaries of state you know asking for, for regulation of embodied carbon so that, and there's just so many working groups there so i think for anyone who does have a few minutes spare of their time you know join the network and, and go along to the event and i think what's nice about ACAN is that you don't you don't have to commit loads of time you, you, you commit what time you have or what you can spare and, and i find myself way too busy to be that committed but i will do something when i can um, and then obviously there's been lots of people on furlough, so there's been a great resource of time going towards this. So I think that would be my number one, really. Thanks, Wolf. I also just remember what Alice said earlier about even if you're sort of not a director or owner of a practice, you can start to implement uh, small scale changes, um, networking events such as this, uh, and then following the larger organisations uh, is all a good way of doing it and, and flying the flag. Um, a broad question here, how and where should we build? I answer that. Ah, we should focus on building in metropolitan environments and we should focus on adapting. What we already have built. Yeah, I mean, that, that point is we've got millions of square metres of empty office space at the moment. <laughs> There's never going to be filled. So that's the... So we've got yeah. to learn how to adapt. Uh, you know, I, I, I've got, I'm looking at a couple of Devons at the moment to turn into different buildings. We've got huge built infrastructure. The skills we're going to have to employ, ones we have, which is how, you know, how to make some of these hulking, great, ugly things beautiful and great spatial experiences. And that's the huge challenge. How do you turn the shard into housing or whatever it is, or a vertical park or whatever it is? It's redundant, but we don't want to pull it down. We've got to make it appropriate for the 21st century and so i think we've built most of what we need to in the uk we've just got to adapt it yeah absolutely thank you duncan um so there's no more questions on the list um so thank you all for attending today i hope you found it a really useful um frozen again brian bad wi-fi i think the year. Am I back on yet? Um, yeah, you're back. Just, yeah. uh, thank you today and thank you to our panel uh, for their presentations and for fielding the questions. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're looking to do more activities of this nature in the future uh, and I hope you can all join us. And finally, just to say, Julie, let's put a list of top tips from our panel that you can download and view. Uh, I think we'll also circulate it after the event. Um, and I hope to see you all again in future events. So thank you.